40% off that, um, that target that we uh, to be achieved in four years. Um, there's a compelling, compelling case for change uh, in relation to current and future disposal costs. It's mainly an economic case that we're going to take to uh, cover it. Uh, uh, but we've obviously achieved such targets without fundamental change. System wide change is needed. And I think again, Carl set that out as you, you may sort of <coughs> you may improve it, but um, there's a need for step change to make the, the sort of targets that we're looking to achieve. Again, I can't mention, I'll, I'll say it again, uh, we're not the first, we won't be the last to make these sort of, uh, these sort of changes. The changes that we've boiled down to have been uh, introduced in every great national authority in the last two years. They've gone for one of the two options that we're, we're considering. Um, however, as, as I mentioned already, <coughs> this is a big moment for council. Most households on the rule will be affected by our decision. So I know the reason why this is so important to, to all council, apart from actually affects everyone on the rule every household, it costs a lot of money. It's uh, 50 and a half, 15 and 4 million pounds uh, living apportionment for uh, 1617. Um, in, in, this, in this period of austerity and reducing public services, um, the levy um, cost sticks out like a, a sore thumb or a lot of tall collar out of our revenue costs. Uh, all other levies like transport are the same. Uh, but they, they, they can't be ignored. We need to, we need to um, address them, particularly as Carl says, they're likely to increase. The, the target of the original 50% is also enshrined in the rural plan. So that was a joint and uh, unanimously approved uh, document. Um, the attractive uh, local environment uh, pledge uh, is key to using that target. It's a key objective of that target, basically. Just in terms of the scale of change that was going to be required to hit 50% in four years, there needs to be a 16,000 tonne shift from our green bin into other receptacles. The grey bin already exists, and, and, and food, etc. is also, significantly, most of our two quarter litre green bins, the bins that we've got now out on, on the streets, are at end of life capacity or sort of expectancy rather. They were all introduced, or the majority were introduced in 1991. The industry um, expectation for bin life is around 25 years. <coughs> Cabinet approved uh, the managing our waste strategy in December. Uh, that's, that strategy, which obviously we've been out since then, sets out the case for performance is improving um, slightly and uh, we, we're, we're doing the, the, the sort of issues that Carl mentioned in terms of what's going into the grain bin, how we've got authorised residual bins out there, etc. Um, in fact, that tends to be a national trend, but it's, it's nowhere near enough to make the sort of targets and changes that we, we need to make. We project that by 2020 without a change or we'll, we'll, we'll increase around 40% uh, every side. So, Cabinet, since that time, have approved that our business case a short list of their options uh, for future arrangements uh, back in June and instructed officers to carry out a full business case to uh, re delve into the remaining options for the details of the assessment. We were also instructed to carry out a detailed uh, public uh, consultation which was carried out this, this summer. I'll come back to that later. The full business case is due to be presented to Cabinet in November and included or to be appended to that will be the conclusion to the consultation exercise and some external validation from waste experts, which are going on straight um, In terms of delivering the uh, exercise, um, we have obviously established a government structure um, and it's been delivered by an internal team. So we, we decided from the, from the start of this process that we would deliver this exercise ourselves uh, through the inter internal project team and put to a board. Um, we created a long list of options. Um, basically, that, 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 that uh, long list was created by researching uh, the industry, identifying best practice, best performance, etc. And we came up with a long list of around um, 11 to 12 options. We shortlisted those options using um, a criteria, success, a success criteria, deliverability factors, such as um, will these options uh, deliver our, our, our targets, will they be probably, probably, probably acceptable, are they affordable? It was a collaborative approach. Um, to make those, to make those decisions and people like the basis of both of those part of, of, of that process. Uh, as I mentioned already, the main, the main options will receive a detailed technical assessment as part of the full business case. And we're doing that now as we're speaking, we're, 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 we're including that basically. The results of the public consultation exercise will be included in, in the full business case and will help the way we shape our recommendations. Um, as I said, the, the full business case is receiving 
external scrutiny from West Ham, where it's basically run um, Carl mentioned that earlier, and their contractors who know me are validating our, our work. Uh, we set that out in December when the, uh, the, the strategy was approved by Cabinet, that we would get a, a, a validation. We would know that we work internally. We want to get a, a waste industry uh, perspective on what we're doing. So, this is the shortlist that we've been uh, studying in detail as part of the business case. Option three is effectively do minimum. We're making, we're making clear that do minimum, as I said already, um, we can improve our performance, but we reckon we, we, we're projecting that will be uh, uh, the maximum projected performance around 40%. So, the two key options we're looking at are basically um, smaller bin um, for um, residual waste, so 140 litre bin collected at the current frequency, or the same bin, the current bin, the 240 litre bin collected on the less Grey recycling bin is collected on the same frequency and we're going to propose to introduce a new bin. So in a bit more detail, um, I won't mention the product provision is a baseline. But as Carl said, over 35% of the content of the green bin are weight, people weight get confused with volume in terms of uh, weight, uh, lots of uh, lightweight um, plastics, etc. By weight, 35% of our bin, according to the disposal of energy composition analysis, is food, and therefore what we're proposing both options is to introduce a system where every household will receive a kitchen caddy, maybe the size of a, a transit surveyor, a five litre caddy, a set of liners which will continue to, to, to replace, which will go into the caddy, and then a lockable um, collection bin, a 23 litre bin, which will be outside uh, and be presented on a weekly basis at the college. The uh, grey bin, as I said, will stay the same, it will be exactly the same way. Garden waste uh, subscription service will also carry on. The big, the big change, the big, the big decision apart from introducing food is what we do with residual waste. We can go one or two routes, and we're making it very clear uh, that we have to do this. There has to be an incentive created by residual waste. Um, we can't, we wouldn't entertain rolling out a food collection service without changing um, the residual uh, capacity. Another authority, an open authority, carrying out a pilot of 2,000 properties uh, with a food only collection service. They're reporting back that there has been next to no take on that service. Why would people take it? But there's not, there's not the incentive to take that food out of those who bin and put it into, a, into that receptacle without changing the, the, the size. So the choice is a smaller bin collected on the same frequency or the same at the moment collected less often than three weekly. Both of the options I mentioned, <coughs> every, every great financial property has chosen one or two. I think Majority chose the smaller bin, um, a, a size of the minority have chosen to remain a 240 to bin collected less often. The full business case, you've seen this choice structure before, I'm assuming this is what we're presenting to uh, Cabinet uh, in November. Um, some, 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 some interesting or important um, messages within this. The scope of the review, uh, there are around 146,000 properties um, on the bill. We're talking about 135,000 properties, we're not talking about um, we're going to deal with multi ops at a later stage. This is all about um, the other types of property across, uh, across the world. Constraints, we are bound by number constraints, not least the, the, the contract we have, the arrangement we have with disposal property. Um, for instance, co mingle, uh, sorry, source, source segregation um, out on site on, on curbs. So you go to Wales and you see these three four systems. Um, that isn't possible. Of the disposal contract. And also, Carl mentioned the economic case of our plastics, and you may want to re recover that. But also, as I understand, Carl, you can perhaps recover this later, it's also physically impossible because of the way our, uh, your system, your facilities are set up in terms of being able to segregate that stuff up in the system. We'll talk about that later. The strategic case um, basically sets out the case for change. Um, obviously, a key thing is our response to the waste management directives. Obligations, but also how it, how it uh, aligns with what we want to do as a council and uh, what the strategic bit is. The economic case is a crucial bit. That's basically where we model the systems, we project uh, performance, uh, we look at the cost benefit analysis, and with that part of the business case, we make a decision on which option we're going to recommend to, uh, to cabinet. 
decision. It's the indicators of that decision. We, 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 um, we were benchmarking, and we have been benchmarking these options with other properties. We've been to places like Bolton, while literally rolling out, as you speak, it's 148 and bins taking back to 246, etc. Um, public consultation, um, <coughs> or you know this, um, we did an extensive exercise, six weeks uh, consultation, 9,000, no, 9,000 uh, responses, <coughs> probably the biggest response the council ever had to a, to a consultation. Um, we're summarising at the moment. Uh, there, are, there are a few headlines I can share with you now. The majority of people don't want food being deleted for collection. Um, the majority of people prefer to, um, to, to stay with the water collection. The size of the job, the size of the don't want any change. Of course, we, we, we make the economic case that change has to happen. There's, there's, a, there's an imperative for, for change. But that will be amended and included in, in, included in the financial business case. Commercial financial managerial case for all basically the implications of uh, what we've through. And that's everything from going into a contract with BIFA, uh, purchasing the uh, the things, etc. Those will be all that uh, part of the, uh, of, the, of the business case. As I mentioned, there is an external validation exercise going on with the brand company contracts. I don't know what you're These are the outcomes that we're looking to achieve um, through the project. Some of them are obvious, some of them are less obvious. Um, we want to achieve this 50% target by 2020, uh, increase participation as a result. Um, a crucial element because of the way the formula is set up, the labor formula is set up, is we need to reduce the overall waste risings on, on the world. We think our, our proposals will help us achieve that. And there are also issues about uh, carbon reduction as well. Uh, cost benefit analysis, some key things to mention here, two or three more slides now. Um, First thing is that every, all three of the options, including the new option, I if we can really decide carry on to carry on as we are because of what, for various reasons, there is a, a significant capital uh, outlay required. I've already mentioned the current 248 bins, the majority of them are 25 years old, they will need to be replaced, not necessarily next year, but over five years. And if we don't, if we face the prospect, the risk of significant service failure, the reliability failure, you think these bins are picked up by their lid, by the lid. Um, for, for the large part every week and then uh, for, the, for, for, for 10 years every other week and pulled by that lip against that weight there, there is a stress issue and we are replacing bins the majority of them are, 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 are in that situation um, obviously we, we face a capital outlay for the one that bins anyway as Carl mentioned several years ago the waste development fund was handed back to councils to all, all the of our councils basically it was, it was a fighting fund to offset uh, potential increases in, um, in landfill tax because that's not been realised because the, uh, the way it's recycled uh, so the, at the age of the waste plants that was given back to us on the understanding that we would use it to transform our waste before so we have a budget the majority of it is available for us to use however obviously in the council's position through the full business case we have to prove that there will be a return on that investment uh, it's not about just spending that we need to demonstrate that we save these disposable costs so that's the investor saying, the investor now has to be the point two has to be implied and not the cost of cost benefit analysis. We think that um, effective waste reduction and increasing our recycling will reduce our disposal cost and that will obviously be a headline within the full business case. Um, the waste levy formula is due to be changed anyway. By agreement, it has to be said, all, all six major solid projects have to agree that unanimously. There is a common agreement that is outdated. It doesn't incentivise recycling enough, and as Carl mentioned, there's a strategic view of the disposal policy going on now, which you can include in November. One of the key terms of reference within that review will be the review of the formula and how it works. Um, and as, as I've already mentioned, we will on the first in, this, in, in, in determining these, uh, these types of facilities, uh, mostly um, Welsh authorities, uh, which I think recently. As an average, reach 60% recycling by doing these type of facilities. I mentioned Great Manchester and other colleges around the country making the same decisions that we're about to make. <coughs> Briefly, this is the final slide implementation. We're, we're going to uh, cabinet in November. Our ratification, um, obviously, call every day expected, but we're going to uh, cabinet council in December. If that goes to plan, we are looking to roll out in spring of 17. Um, the way we'll do that is one round a day, we've got about 114 rounds and we'll also take several months to, to implement. Uh, clearly, a long 
long-term communications plan is needed based from decision and all the way through up to our lives and on the plan for some period of time like that. There is a significant logistics plan to, to put in place and to, and to work. I've mentioned some of the things about the contract and the rolling out systems, etc. There'll be a resident support package before joining out. <coughs> People basically um, you know, being out there on, on the doorstep um, for a simple, simple time. We did all these sort of activities 10 years ago, of course, when we introduced alternative collections on the will, and that's got embedded uh, over time. Um, the, um, the, the, the dialogue's going to be dealing with a, 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 a system bedding in, an issue that we'll need to resolve, but we'll, we'll, we'll put that into our planning process. And we'll immediately need to start looking at uh, beyond uh, 2020.
a very, it's a very tough nut to crack, to be honest. Chris, I'll share it because I've got that in mind. Um, thanks for the uh, presentation, very interesting, some really surprising figures and facts that came out of that. One of my questions was this, this graph you, you did, you know, it steadily goes down on the recycling rate from 2011, 12, and 13, 14, 15, and goes slightly up again. Do we know what that trend was about? Why that happened? The, the, the majority of the, the reduction is about, is about 4% is because of the introduction of the garden waste restriction service. So uh, 4% um, basically was, was wiped off because we introduced garden waste. So whereas uh, there were a large amount of bins um, on the world, brand bins before, uh, a, a, a minority of people took up the subscription service. Right. So it was the subscription service that Yes, that's correct. Yeah. 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 Incidentally, um, whilst your recycling level went down, yeah. the Merseyside household recycling centres went up in terms of green waste. Yeah. Quite a bit of it turned up at Clatterbridge, yeah. West Kirby and Bidston. So it was still recycled, it's just that people didn't put it in your brown bin, they brought it to the household recycling centre. So it's an artificial situation unless you look at the whole picture. We actually picked this, a good proportion of that was picked up in recycling through the household waste recycling centers. And to be fair, quite a big proportion of people look like their own composting. Yeah. Just, just yeah. Anyone else? Jim? I can't. I, I think you may have answered this, but I don't know that, that I heard it correctly. Um, with the plastic card and paper, um, altogether you're looking at about 28%. Is it you said you don't have the um, mechanism for segregating that waste further? Carbon paper we do, carbon paper we want to get the price for it, okay? That's easy. Plastics is more complicated because there are so many different polymers of plastic. Certain polymers command a fabulous price in the market, so your pet plastic milk bottles, for instance, get a decent price for them. Certain other plastics you'll get nothing for, and that's the issue. So if you take the example of plastic tubs and trays, you sort of the black tray. You, it's perfectly possible to mechanically separate that material from the other plastic. But if I told you that to put such a machine into the Veolia recycling facility might cost £300,000, and I can't guarantee you get a penny back when you try and sell that material, and in fact what it will do is reduce the price of your good, good plastics and your not good plastics, you'd say to me, well, why would you do it then? You know, it's not that every, not that every commodity in the demand of good price. But what we look at is the overall basket of materials, the paper, the card, the cans, the glass, some of the plastic. Overall, that still makes us money. Us being the council taxpayer, by the way, because that money comes back off the levy and therefore is off the council tax. So as a group of materials, we're always trying to pick the optimum type group of materials to get the best market price. If you then start to introduce materials that are effectively being very heavily subsidised, you're lowering the revenue you're getting from all the materials, and that is a direct effect on the levy and a direct effect on the council tax. So we've got to be careful about value for money. The cost benefit of putting in very expensive kits, and it does exist, you can do it, when you get nothing back for that material, you know, it's not, not, not a very strong economic case. Particular type of material, the economic 
so I'm not in your favor. Okay, I think it's Stephen. Uh, uh, my question is, is uh, well, you know, perhaps between the two of you can answer it. I mean, it's undoubtable that a big portion of BIM uh, that up, up until this period has been ignored, which is food waste. It, it, it's the viability of what food waste can be used for, usefully. Now you turn about, talk about turning it into gas, turning it into energy. Are those facilities up and running available for, for us to actually make use of it in the here and now, rather than wait for someone else to build it? Are the facilities there? Could we, could we turn a profit, perhaps? Yeah, we currently have Sefton and St Helens collecting food waste. That goes to ReFood in Witness, which is a big anaerobic digester. Plant, um, the gas is injected into the gas grid, so that it's used alongside not sea gas. If you like. um, those facilities exist. It's the owner's job to find the best price for processing that waste to keep the contract with the price to us and then put the tax down. Um, I know we have got plans to expand their capacity, and they're able to take certainly able to take quite a lot more. They're mostly commercial food waste, actually, mostly supermarket, back of supermarket type food waste. The household food waste is a relatively small proportion, it wouldn't be a problem to them. And there are other facilities. What we do is we ask the contractor to use their commercial acumen to find you know, a nearby, hopefully nearby, because transport problem with these that's the this actually. Um, the right gate feed from the right provider, there's an open market for it. But there are currently one in Merseyside, uh, in Alton, which is taking the food waste from Sorry, did you that? And that, that facility you know, would, would be ready to, to jump in straight away. So, the way it would work is that we would collect the waste, it would go to Binston properly and we could create a facility there. And then it would be articulated over to the food uh, plants in Witness. The other thing to know, which, which, uh, which Carl met, touched on in his presentation, is working now with those who travel and uh, disposal property to create solutions for, uh, for gas and for public transport for our vehicles. Can I ask you about the um, material waste? Because we were always told you could put it into recycling. Um, most people, a lot of people, put it into bags to give to charity shops. Or, or I was hoping when those shops owned by people could sell it, we would do that. But we're up against a society where you can go to Primark and buy yourself a jumper and a skirt for. £12 and wear it today and throw it away tomorrow. And people are throwing it away. And it, it just seems that we're never going to get rid of that sort of attitude. And obviously, we don't want to put the shops like Primark out of business because they have a lot of staff and a lot of people rely on them for the clothes. But how, how, do, how do we do that? Because nobody seems to say, other than taking them to a recycle bin, which a lot of people don't want to do. Putting them in the charity banks, which a lot of people don't want to do, and selling them doesn't seem to have been. I, I really thought when I saw those shops that people would sell the stuff because it would make some money out of them. But you see, you know, where, where I live in Clatterbridge, you see bags round by the motorway, and clothes in black bags that have just been dumped because they can't get into the Clatterbridge store. <coughs> Um, <coughs> I, I agree. Um, what you got with the textile, the clothing shops, you know, 50p a bag or whatever it was, or 50p a kilo, was the commodity prices going and then. When times go, people open shops and give you 50p a bag for your clothes. When the clothing market prices drop, they close up shop and forget it. So it's a difficulty. Um, it's, textiles is a very interesting one because actually, carbon footprint, the biggest carbon footprint of almost any of the waste in your village is textiles. Just the energy and the miles that have to go into making these things is enormous. So the carbon footprint of textiles is big, really big. Um, what can you do about it? I think you start with the education side around the carbon, <coughs> in fact, the environmental damage that's caused, the uh, opportunity to donate, you increase the opportunity to donate. I mean, some councils have actually done the textile collection, but it tends to be very expensive. Charities tend to do just as good a job for a lot less money. Yeah. 
accessible as possible to people and letting people know. I mean, interestingly, we're developing things like apps now. You know, we just launched an app for sharing food, um, not waste food. Um, the, the same sort of thing exists for things like clothes or anything like that, non food items. Uh, people want to do it, but it's got to be easy for them. Um, some of the charities need a bit of support to pay for a van and a driver to actually go and pick the vans up. That's all it really takes. And I mentioned uh, you know, some of the community funds, we, it's very small and relatively. But we're encouraging councils to think about what other organisations can do for you within your overall waste strategy. You don't really want to be picking up textiles, but they have got a massive impact. And you may want to think about support for those kind of organisations, because as long as they're accounting for what they're doing back to you, you are helping your overall waste strategy. You don't want them in the recycling bin because they foul up all the machines. A pair of Levi jeans is a catastrophe in these sorts of machines, it sucks the whole line. Okay, uh, any more questions? Yeah, just a quick question. Uh, you mentioned in your presentation that there was a pilot scheme going on in Manchester that just gave them the blueprints for food and it wasn't going to work very well, it wasn't working very well. It, it was me and it was um, it's a Merseyside authority by my neighbours. So my question is, um, do we have any uh, alternative plans within our suggests that you must maintain your engagement program and communications, otherwise it will tail off. Um, it's happened to a lot of authorities. They've tried to cut back on the door knocking and the education and the communications and they've, re and they've realised you've got to put some, some effort into that. Um, another thing that's quite interesting is the idea of the, the gas-powered food-based collection vehicles is that people often say, well, I don't know what happens to it. If you can feed back to people, when you do this, this is, a, you'll see gas powered buses or gas powered vehicles from your food waste. I mean, Bristol famously has the poo bus, I don't know if it. Let's not go there. But it's powered by gas from sewage. And, and it's just a way of bringing back to people and like making it um, more feedback to people about what actually happens to this and what good it can do. Because the gas powered vehicles, one of the great advantages of them, unlike diesel, there's almost no particular pollution. And, and there are air quality issues in the city. I mean, particularly in Liverpool as a city, the main city, but, but nevertheless, you know, there are hotspots in most parts. Um, in air quality things. So there you are you are helping achieve better air quality the more you can move to alternative fuels, not just gas, obviously, but hydrogen, electric, or whatever else. So it's about giving people some feedback. I think about what we're going to do. Okay, I'm conscious we've been on this for about an hour. So, Julie, I've got you next, but is it further questions to ask? Um, no, I'll, I'll speak to them later. Is that okay? Do you know what we're doing now? It's, it's just a quick question, probably. It's about the uh, weight regulations. I know it's only a small amount, but aren't suppliers or manufacturers supposed to uh, dispose of that? Why are we as a council paying 
to dispose of goods that should be going back to the manufacturer or the supplier. Don't mind doing that though, because I'm guessing the majority are small micro groups. Yeah, you're, you're right. The manufacturers are supposed to be under obligation, but what they do is pay local authorities mm -hmm. to act on their behalf. So when you go to, because it's inevitable, some people will do it. Um, but it's a very interesting point because it raises, where is the English waste strategy likely to go? There's a big push on by the industry, if you like, the likes of local companies like, like ourselves. There's a big push to make the producers responsible for the collection of waste. There's actually people saying it should be taken out of global authority control altogether because we don't produce the waste, but we've got we've got a big enough pay for it. Um, and the producers and the reprocessors are the ones who want the material, they make it or they want it, why not make it in? So there's a thing called producer responsibility, which is the we the example is a very good one. There are calls for extending that producer responsibility so that the manufacturer, people who create the waste, not the consumer who uses the product. And it's the same over-packaging, you know, if anybody's bought anything recently, it's in one of those impossible to open vacuum packs. You know, there's this bit in the actual thing you're buying is about this bit. Now, to make the producers of that place, because that, they're incentivized then to, to minimize the packaging. So there's, a, there's definitely a move, and the government's considering the English waste strategy. Um, there's definitely calls for extended producer responsibility and moving costs. Uh, away from local authorities and onto the people who produce the waste in the first place. Okay, uh, thank you, Carl, and Mike. That's really informative. Um, I'm certain we'll ask you back to give some report on this.